The Byzantine Greeks or Byzantines were the medieval Greek or Hellenized citizens of the Byzantine Empire, centered mainly in Constantinople, the southern Balkans, the Greek islands, Asia Minor, Cyprus and the large urban centers of the Levant and northern Egypt. Throughout the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Greeks self-identified as Romae and Greekoi but are referred to as Byzantines and Byzantine Greeks. In modern historiography, the terms Byzantine Empire and Byzantine Greeks were first coined in the English language by British historian George Finlay. The social structure of the Byzantine Greeks was primarily supported by a rural, agrarian base that consisted of the peasantry and a small fraction of the poor. These peasants lived within three kinds of settlements, the Koraon or village, the Agridian or hamlet, and the Prostein or estate. Many civil disturbances that occurred during the time of the Byzantine Empire were attributed to political factions within the empire rather than to this large popular base. Soldiers among the Byzantine Greeks were at first conscripted amongst the rural peasants and trained on an annual basis. As the Byzantine Empire entered the 11th century, more of the soldiers within the army were either professional men-at-arms or mercenaries. Until the 12th century, education within the Byzantine Greek population was more advanced than in the West, particularly at primary school level, resulting in high literacy rates. Success came easily to Byzantine Greek merchants, who enjoyed a very strong position in international trade. Despite the challenges posed by rival Italian merchants, they held their own throughout the latter half of the Byzantine Empire's existence. The clergy also held a special place, not only having more freedom than their Western counterparts, but also maintaining a patriarch in Constantinople who was considered the equal of the Pope. This position of strength had built up over time, for at the beginning of the Byzantine Empire, under Emperor Constantine the Great, only a small part, about 10%, of the population was Christian. The language of the Byzantine Greeks since the age of Constantine had been Greek, although Latin was the language of the administration. From the reign of Emperor Heraclius, Greek was the predominant language amongst the populace and also replaced Latin in administration. At first the Byzantine Empire had a multi-ethnic character, but following the loss of the non-Greek-speaking provinces it came to be dominated by the Byzantine Greeks. Over time, the relationship between them and the West, particularly with Latin Europe, deteriorated. Relations were further damaged by a schism between the Catholic Western Orthodox East that led to the Byzantine Greeks being labeled as heretics in the West. Throughout the later centuries of the Byzantine Empire and particularly following the coronation of Charlemagne in Rome in 800, the Byzantine Greeks were not considered by Western Europeans as heirs of the Roman Empire, but rather as part of an Eastern kingdom made up of Greek peoples. However the Byzantine Empire could claim to be the Roman Empire, continuing the unbroken line of succession of the Roman emperors. Terminology During most of the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Greeks identified themselves as Romaioi a term which in the Greek language had become synonymous with Christian Greeks. They also identified themselves as Greekoi. The ethnonym was used habitually for self-referential purposes except in official Byzantine political correspondence prior to the Fourth Crusade of 1204. The ancient name Hellene was in popular use synonymous to pagan and was revived as an ethnonym in the Middle Byzantine period. While in the West the term Roman acquired a new meaning in connection with the Catholic Church and the Bishop of Rome, the Greek form Romaioi remained attached to the Greeks of the Eastern Roman Empire. These people called themselves Romaioi in their language, and the term Byzantines or Byzantine Greeks is an exonym applied by later historians like Hieronymus Wolff. 
However, the use of the term Byzantine Greeks for the Romaioi is not entirely uncontroversial. Most historians agree that the defining features of their civilization were 1. Greek language, culture, literature, and science 2. Roman law and tradition 3. Christian faith the term Byzantine has been adopted by Western scholarship on the assumption that anything Roman is essentially Western, and also by modern Greek scholarship for nationalistic reasons of identification with ancient Greece. In modern times, the Greek people still use the ethnonyms Romaioi and Graecoi to refer to themselves. In addition, the Eastern Roman Empire was in language and civilization a Greek society. Byzantinist August Heisenberg defined the Byzantine Empire as the Christianized Roman Empire of the Greek nation. Byzantium was primarily known as the Empire of the Greeks by foreigners due to the predominance of Greek linguistic, cultural, and demographic elements. Historic perspective, Byzantine Greeks, forming the majority of the Byzantine Empire proper at the height of its power, gradually came under the dominance of foreign powers with the decline of the empire during the Middle Ages. Mostly coming under Arab Muslim rule, Byzantine Greeks either fled their former lands or subdued to the new Muslim rulers receiving the status of dhimmi. Over the centuries surviving Christian societies of former Byzantine Greeks evolved into Antiochian Greeks. Melkites or merged into the societies of Arab Christians existing to this day. On the other hand, other Byzantines converted to Islam and underwent Turkification over time, mainly those in Anatolia. Society while social mobility was not unknown in Byzantium the order of society was thought of as more enduring, with the average man regarding the court of heaven to be the archetype of the imperial court in Constantinople. This society included various classes of people that were neither exclusive nor immutable. The most characteristic were the poor, the peasants, the soldiers, the teachers, entrepreneurs, and clergy. The poor according to a text dated to AD 533, a man was termed poor if he did not have 50 gold coins, which was a modest though not negligible sum. The Byzantines were heirs to the Greek concepts of charity for the sake of the polis. Nevertheless it was the Christian concepts attested in the Bible that animated their giving habits and specifically the examples of Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, and John Chrysostom. The number of the poor fluctuated in the many centuries of Byzantium's existence, but they provided a constant supply of muscle power for the building projects and rural work. Their numbers apparently increased in the late 4th and early 5th centuries as barbarian raids and a desire to avoid taxation pushed rural populations into cities. Since Homeric times, there were several categories of poverty. The Tochos was lower than the Penis. They formed the majority of the infamous Constantinopolitan mob whose function was similar to the mob of the First Rome. However, while there are instances of riots attributed to the poor, the majority of civil disturbances were specifically attributable to the various factions of the Hippodrome like the Greens and Blues. The poor made up a non-negligible percentage of the population, but they influenced the Christian society of Byzantium to create a large network of hospitals and arms houses, and a religious and social model largely justified by the existence of the poor and born out of the Christian transformation of classical society. Peasantry There are no reliable figures as to the numbers of the peasantry. Yet it is widely assumed that the vast majority of Byzantines lived in rural and agrarian areas. In the Tactica of Emperor Leo VI the Wise, the two professions defined as the backbone of the state are the peasantry and the soldiers. The reason for this was that, besides producing most of the empire's food, the peasants also produced most of its taxes. Peasants lived mostly in villages, whose name changed slowly from the classical comb to the modern choreo. While agriculture and herding were the dominant occupations of villages they were not the only ones. There are records for the small town of Lamsakos, situated on the eastern shore of the Hellespont. 
which out of 173 households classifies 113 as peasant and 60 as urban, which indicate other kinds of ancillary activities. The treatise on taxation, preserved in the Bibliotheca Marciana in Venice, distinguishes between three types of rural settlements, the Coron or village, the Agridian or hamlet, and the Prostine or estate. According to a 14th-century survey of the village of Afitos, donated to the monastery of Calanda, the average size of a landholding is only 3.5 modioi. Taxes placed on rural populations included the Karpnikon or hearth tax, the Sinan or cash payment frequently affiliated with the Karpnikon, the Enomen or pasture tax, and the Erikon which depended on the village's population and ranged between 4 and 20 gold coins annually. Their diet consisted of mainly grains and beans and in fishing communities fish was usually substituted for meat. Bread, wine, and olives were important staples of Byzantine diet with soldiers on campaign eating double-baked and dried bread called Paximodian. As in antiquity and modern times, the most common cultivations in the Corophia were olive groves and vineyards. While Leoprand of Cremona, a visitor from Italy, found Greek wine irritating as it was often flavoured with resin most other Westerners admired Greek wines, Cretan in particular being famous. While both hunting and fishing were common, the peasants mostly hunted to protect their herds and crops. Apiculture, the keeping of bees, was as highly developed in Byzantium as it had been in ancient Greece. Aside from agriculture, the peasants also labored in the crafts, fiscal inventories mentioning smiths, tailors, and cobblers. Soldiers during the Byzantine millennium, hardly a year passed without a military campaign. Soldiers were a normal part of everyday life, much more so than in modern Western societies. While it is difficult to draw a distinction between Roman and Byzantine soldiers from an organizational aspect, it is easier to do so in terms of their social profile. The military handbooks known as the Tactica continue the Hellenistic and Roman tradition and contain a wealth of information about the appearance, customs, habits, and life of the soldiers. As with the peasantry, many soldiers performed ancillary activities, like medics and technicians. Selection for military duty was annual with yearly call-ups and great stock was placed on military exercises during the winter months, which formed a large part of a soldier's life. Until the 11th century, the majority of the conscripts were from rural areas. While the conscription of craftsmen and merchants is still an open question, from then on, professional recruiting replaced conscription, and the increasing use of mercenaries in the army was ruinous for the treasury. From the 10th century onwards, there were laws connecting land ownership and military service. While the state never allotted land for obligatory service, soldiers could and did use their pay to buy landed estates and taxes would be decreased or waived in some cases. What the state did allocate to soldiers, however, from the 12th century onwards, were the tax revenues from some estates called pronoi. As in antiquity, the basic food of the soldier remained the dried biscuit bread, though its name had changed from bokalatan to paximodian. Teachers' Byzantine education was the product of an ancient Greek educational tradition that stretched back to the 5th century BC. It comprised a tripartite system of education that, taking shape during the Hellenistic era, was maintained, with inevitable changes, up until the fall of Constantinople. The stages of education were the elementary school, where pupils ranged from 6 to 10 years, secondary school, where pupils ranged from 10 to 16, and higher education. Elementary education was widely available throughout most of the Byzantine Empire's existence, in the countryside, as well as in towns. This, in turn, ensured that literacy was much more widespread than in Western Europe, at least until the 12th century. Secondary education was confined to the larger cities while higher education was the exclusive provenance of Constantinople. The elementary school teacher occupied a low social position and taught mainly from simple fairy tale books. 
However, the grammarian and rhetorician teachers responsible for the following two phases of education were more respected. These used classical Greek texts like Homer's Iliad or Odyssey and much of their time was taken with detailed word-for-word -word explication. Books were rare and very expensive and likely only possessed by teachers who dictated passages to students. Women Women have tended to be overlooked in Byzantine studies as Byzantine society left few records about them. Women were disadvantaged in some aspects of their legal status and in their access to education, and limited in the freedom of movement. The life of a Byzantine Greek woman could be divided into three phases girlhood, motherhood, and widowhood. Childhood was brief and perilous, even more so for girls than boys. Parents would celebrate the birth of a boy twice as much and there is some evidence of female infanticide, though it was contrary to both civil and canon law. Educational opportunities for girls were few. They did not attend regular schools but were taught in groups at home by tutors. With few exceptions, education was limited to literacy and the Bible. A famous exception is the Princess Anna Komnena, whose Alexia displays a great depth of erudition. The majority of a young girl's daily life would be spent in household and agrarian chores, preparing herself for marriage. For most girls, childhood came to an end with the onset of puberty, which was followed shortly after by betrothal and marriage. Although marriage arranged by the family was the norm, romantic love was not unknown. Most women bore many children but few survived infancy, and grief for the loss of a loved one was an inalienable part of life. The main form of birth control was abstinence, and while there is evidence of contraception it seems to have been mainly used by prostitutes. Due to prevailing norms of modesty, women would wear clothing that covered the whole of their body except their hands. While women among the poor sometimes wore sleeveless tunics, most women were obliged to cover even their hair with the long maffarian veil. Women of means, however, spared no expense in adorning their clothes with exquisite jewelry and fine silk fabrics. Divorces were hard to obtain even though there were laws permitting them. Husbands would often beat their wives, though the reverse was not unknown. As in Theodore Prodromos's description of a battered husband in the Tocoprodromus poems, although female life expectancy in Byzantium was lower than that of men, due to death in childbirth, wars and the fact that men married younger, female widowhood was still fairly common. Still, some women were able to circumvent societal strictures and work as traders, artisans, abbots, entertainers, and scholars. Entrepreneurs The traditional image of Byzantine Greek merchants is unenterprising benefactors of state aid is beginning to change for that of mobile, proactive agents. The merchant class, particularly that of Constantinople, became a force of its own that could, at times, even threatened the emperor as it did in the 11th and 12th centuries. This was achieved through efficient use of credit and other monetary innovations. Merchants invested surplus funds in financial products called Creacononia, the equivalent and perhaps ancestor of the later Italian commender. Eventually, the purchasing power of Byzantine merchants became such that it could influence prices in markets as far afield as Cairo and Alexandria. In reflection of their success, emperors gave merchants the right to become members of the Senate, that is to integrate themselves with the ruling elite. This had an end by the end of the 11th century when political machinations allowed the landed aristocracy to secure the throne for a century and more. Following that phase, however, the enterprising merchants bounced back and wielded real clout during the time of the Third Crusade. The reason Byzantine Greek merchants have often been neglected in historiography is not that they were any less able than their ancient or modern. Greek colleagues in matters of trade. It rather originated with the way history was written in Byzantium, which was often under the patronage of their competitors, the court, and land aristocracy. The fact that they were eventually surpassed by their Italian rivals is attributable to the privileges sought and acquired by the Crusader states. 
within the Levant and the dominant maritime violence of the Italians. Clergy unlike in Western Europe where priests were clearly demarcated from the laymen, the clergy of the Eastern Roman Empire remained in close contact with the rest of society. Readers and subdeacons were drawn from the laity and expected to be at least 20 years of age while priests and bishops had to be at least 30. Unlike the Latin Church, the Byzantine Church allowed married priests and deacons as long as they were married before ordination. Bishops, however, were required to be unmarried, while the religious hierarchy mirrored the empire's administrative divisions, the clergy were more ubiquitous than the emperor's servants. The issue of Caesaropapism, while usually associated with the Byzantine Empire, is now understood to be an oversimplification of actual conditions in the empire, by the 5th century. The Patriarch of Constantinople was recognized as first among equals of the four Eastern Patriarchs and as of equal status with the Pope in Rome. The ecclesiastical provinces were called epochies and were headed by archbishops or metropolitans who supervised their subordinate bishops or episcopoi. For most people, however, it was their parish priest or popiers that was the most recognizable face of the clergy.